So last week I talked about breath. Um, if you think of um, the human being as being in concentric circles, and we start at the center, and we more or less put the breath at the, at the, at the center. And we use that breath to stabilize ourselves at the center, to center ourselves. Um, centering ourselves means uh, training ourselves to be here and now, to be in the present moment, as opposed to being caught up or lost in a mind that takes us out of the present moment, into future thinking, past thinking, fantasy thinking, whatever. So we begin with the breath. The breath is stabilizing, kind of brings us into the center, into the present moment. And then from that center, and hopefully that's the stability that the breath can give us, then we move out to the, to the next concentric circle, uh, which is our body, our physical experience, our embodied experience. And then beyond that, uh, we go to our emotions. Beyond that, we go to um, our thinking world. And then we go beyond that to what's called the mind. And then beyond that, we, everything else. And the idea is to fill in the center in a sense. So the center is kind of has a stable base. It's kind of full. And then as that uh, center is full, then it kind of provides stability to the outer edges of the circle. But if you just have the outer edges of the circle by itself, then you have a very narrow, in a sense, kind of orbit that you're kind of spinning in. And it's actually quite fragile, quite fl- um, and can easily bend and break and stuff. So if you live in your world of your thinking only, which some people do, thinking is actually a very fragile world to live in and um, is subject to all kinds of, um, 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 you know, ups and downs that uh, can cause a lot of suffering for people. And um, so when thinking is kind of disembodied, thinking is kind of disconnected to the other inner circles, kind of, then it becomes kind of not so realistic. It's not grounded. So the idea is we don't want to stop thinking in Buddhist training or mindfulness. We want to have our thinking, in a sense, be embodied or realistic or connected. And so we want to fill in the kind of fill in the picture, fill in the, what's in inside. So um, we start in the breath, and then we go into the body. So today's subject is the body, and the, our embodiment, including our physical experience, our physical embodied experience, as part of what we pay attention to. And um, now, one of the marvelous things about the body, our physical experience, our embodied experience is that that experience is always in the present moment. Our thoughts might be somewhere else. Our mind might be somewhere else. But the body is always here and now. And part of the task of of meditation practice is to bring the body and mind together so they're in the same place at the same time. So they're working together harmoniously. So they're not at odds at each other. We're going in cross purposes to each other. And since you're not going to bring, when you meditate, you're not going to, you know, it's not a matter of bringing your body to the mind. Um, it's really a matter of bringing your mind to your body so the two can be together in, in harmony. If you're sitting here and you're thinking about what you're going to do tomorrow, then your body is here and now, but your mind is tomorrow. If you're th- sitting here, here and you're thinking about you know, what's on television tonight at home, then you're here, you're here, both here and there, you're here in the present and in this time, but uh, your mind is in another place. And so, again, so uh, it's really important for the purposes of mindfulness meditation to bring the body and mind in harmony. Or in, in uh, Buddhist circles, they talk about unification, bringing the, the mind and body into some kind of unity. Um, and this is part of the purpose of meditation. So it becomes a training, a uh, big part of training is to uh, train the mind to come and be in the same place as your body. And, um, and the body is an important help in this process because the body is, is, is in the present moment. So if you're connected to the body, you're in the present moment. Now, um, anytime we do mindfulness meditation, which is this very simple practice of, of noticing very simply, bringing attention to experience and letting that experience, the presence of mind to that experience, registering what's here. So if you're with your breathing, it's not only being with your, breath, with your breath, one breath, in breath, out breath, being with it, but it's also, in some ways, letting that experience of breathing in be registered in your system. Oh, you're taking like, like it you're, like, you're, like you're being, like your awareness is a sponge, and you're taking in those sensations, that experience, in a deeper way, fuller way. It's like maybe, um, you know, you get out of your car on Highway 1, and, uh, you know, a nice sunny day, and it's on the beach there on the edge of the ocean, 
and you kind of stand there and you take in the breeze, the smell of the ocean, the sights. You kind of there and really let it register, take it in. Um, and um, so, in the same way, you sit to your breath and you kind of take in that full, the fullness of the experience of breathing in. Um, now, what often happens, what's often confused with mindfulness, is um, commentary, commenting about the experience, making a judgment, making an evaluation about it. And I like to, uh, I liken this, um, or there's kind of an example of this that I learned many years ago. Um, I was teaching a re- meditation retreat with some other meditation teachers, and two of them loved uh, watching football. Actually, what they loved was the 49ers, back, back when they were winning. And so, um, sometimes there were these breaks during the schedule for the teachers, and, and we'd go into the teacher's room and we'd watch this 49er game. So it was three of us, three guys watching, you know, three Buddhist teachers watching 49ers. And, um, and um, so we watched, and it was fine. But then there was a commercial, and the guy who had the remote would push the mute button, which seemed like a very sensible thing to do when the commercials come on. So um, at some point, the commercials were over, and the game started. And the guy with the mute didn't push the button to get the sounds back. And since he was a teacher of attention, of mindfulness, I figured he knew what he was doing. I'm sure he noticed that the sound hadn't come on. We'd stop talking, we were looking. And so we, for a few minutes, we watched the game without any sound. And while we did that, I could follow the game. I can kind of follow what goes on. It's you know, kind of not so complicated. You see these guys lined up facing each other and they fall down. <laughs> And then every once in a while you see some guy kind of running past the fallen down guys and you're happy for him. He crosses those lines and, you know, kind of, and then you see some guy coming out of the back and tackling him and oh, too bad he didn't make it. And you kind of follow. And um, but after a while, my friend did hit the button and the sound came back on. And it really struck me very soon how different the experience was watching the game without the sound and watching with the sound. And with the sound, it was a lot more exciting. I got pulled into the game much more. And there was a sportscaster who was making commentary about the game. And it wasn't just simply some guy who was luckily making it past these lines. It was, you know, oh my, he's on the 30, he's on the 20, he's got, oh no, you know. And this excitement goes in there, right? And there's, not, there's a sound of the fans and everything. And I got pulled into the game through the excitement of the commentator. And normally when I watched football, I wouldn't separate the experience of the game from the commentary. They're just one whole, in a sense. It's like the, uh, with canned laughter, the joke's not funny. But because it's canned laughter we listen to, we get pulled into the joke. Or mood music. You know, it looks like it's just a nice, beautiful pastoral scene in the woods. You know, it looks very happy. But then you hear this ominous music. And then, oh, oh. <laughs> you know, you can get frightened just looking at it. So the mood music kind of, so the scene is what it is, but the mood music affects your experience of the scene. So the commentator for the football game affects the experience of watching the game. There's nothing wrong with that. That's part of the fun of football, I suppose. But, um, but uh, the same phenomena happens in our own minds. We have commentary, commentating going on in our minds. And that commentary, we unfortunately will take it to be uh, integral or part of the experience we're having. So, um, and so it influences our experience of the situation. So we might be in some, um, some benign, nice situation and someone uh, walks in and there might be a judgment of that person. That person is, you know, lousy or that person is something. And so that commentary go- goes on and we don't have real evidence of who the person is, just a kind of flip kind of judgment. But that commentary, that judgment affects then the way we see that person. And so... The, the person in our commentary had become entangled. Or the same thing about ourselves. We're sitting and meditating and we're following a few breaths and the mind wanders off, which is pretty common. And then there's a commentary that says, um, I am a bad meditator. I wonder if I should be doing Sufi dancing. <laughs> and uh, and uh, so that we get called up in this commentary, but the commentary might not be so friendly. It might actually be quite critical and we might get frustrated, and then we get pulled into the world of frustration. And we don't separate the fact that the breath is very simple. You know, breath is one way, and we're getting distracted, just a very simple kind of thing we can be aware of. 
But we've gotten complicated with this judgments and valuations of what it means. We've had, started adding meaning to it. So unfortunately, um, no one yet has discovered a mute button for the mind. So it's not so easy to just say, you know, stop making the commentary and judgments. But one very important aspect of mindfulness meditation is to understand how the commenting, judging, evaluating, meaning-making mind works and to be able to tease apart the commentary from the actual experience. And this is really crucial for both for mindfulness meditation, but from a Buddhist point of view, for the purpose of discover, discovering our freedom. So distinguish between what's happening and our interpretation of it, what's happening and our judgments of it, what's happening and our commentary about it, what's happening and the meaning we assign to it. So here's a meaning story, meaning-making story that I like. Sylvia Borstein is a Vipassana teacher at Spirit Rock. Many years ago, she decided to go do a personal retreat or something at the San Francisco Zen Center, go spend a few days there at the guest house, guest room. So she called up the office and they said, oh, the guest manager is not here right now. Call back when he's here. Uh, or he'll call you. He said, well, he'll call you. So the guest master, ma- manager called her back. And she wasn't home, so he left a message saying, this is the guest manager, call me and we'll book your room or something. So she called back to the Zen Center, into the office, and he wasn't in. So then Sylvia said, oh, I think this means I wasn't supposed to come. And the Zen student who is the office said, no, I think it just means Robert wasn't in. (laughs) So again, in this example, she was making meaning out of it. It means that I shouldn't come. It's just he wasn't in. It's just very simple. So there's this movement of meaning-making movement. So to separate that out and try to stay really simple. Now, if you, you might still be making the commentary and judgments, but uh, then to see it, see it as that and don't be fooled by it. Don't think that's the real picture. Also, um, to realize that diff- there's a difference between what's happening and the judgments, what's happening in the commentary, what's happening and the thinking about what's happening. And to at least in principle, understand that mindfulness meditation is choosing to not live in the thinking, in the commentary and the judgments, but instead live in the awareness, in the attention to what's happening. Do you understand that principle? At least in principle you understand. So there's a choice being made in mindfulness meditation. And that choice is, you're not saying don't think. We don't say don't think. We're saying don't live there. Don't get engaged in it. Don't get swept away in those thoughts. Let the attention open up, be soft, be relaxed, and have a silent awareness. Just like you would look at the sunset at the beach. You, know, you don't think about the sunset. You just take it in. You know, it's kind of a silent awareness. You might think about it, but thinking about it is not the sunset. It's kind of more, it's, there's not much, much discursive thought that goes into the sunset seeing it. So the same thing. Uh, so we're not living in the thoughts, but we're taking in the actual experience. So this is true with our body, with our meditation. It's very important in meditation to learn to separate out what's the immediate ex- this experience from the interpretation of judgment, the commentary. This, in theory, makes meditation, the experience of meditation, very simple. Um, it's just, you know, just simply what's here simply what the experience is. Um, and um, whereas once we get in the, uh, involved in the world of thinking and meaning making and judgment and analysis, then it can get very complicated very quickly. It's very simple. Um, so a few more words before we meditate. Um, so the, our physical body, our body is a very important part of who we are, a part of the, important part of the human experience. And there's certainly uh, plenty of people who are disconnected to their body. Some people are that way because of their profession, their work. They spend their whole time kind of doing work that involves thinking a lot uh, at the computer, perhaps, or something. And so they just, because of years and years of habit that that's where they're living, they're not so connected to their body. Some people, uh, because of psychological things that happen to them, uh, uh, disconnect from their body because to be in their body means to feel all your feelings. And so they don't want to feel all their feelings. It's been the trauma perhaps earlier in life or maybe it's whatever. And so they just kind of disconnect. They don't really touch into that part of their, 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 their life. 
Um, mindfulness works a lot better if you are connected to your body. And so for many people, it's a slow training to reawaken the body, to rediscover the body. And so that, you, so that the awareness, the sense, ability to, to sense that exists in the body becomes stronger and more heightened as we do this meditation practice. Uh, in a sense, uh, the idea of being present here and now is not just a mental thing. There's nothing we do with the mind. It's, it helps it's helped a lot in something you do with your body. You show up with your body. You're here with your body. And to think about that when you sit down to meditate, you're not just kind of checking out, uh, checking out of your body in order to have some kind of strange mental experience or mental spiritual experience. You want to sit down and you pay attention and sit in a way where you kind of show up with your body. You're going to be here in your body. The body is a tremendous support for the practice of attention and awareness. And in a sense, to show up in your body and see if you can have a fullness of a being in your body. To feel like, here I am. I'm, in a sense, uh, for the time being at least, you feel solid, connected, rooted. Um, the kind of, uh, uh, there's a common kind of visualization that's done in meditation circles where you visualize, visualize yourself as a mountain. You know, it works pretty well if you sit cross-legged, this triangle. And you're kind of rooted, solid, kind of here. Here you are. And the mind might wander away to other times and other places. And then the idea is to come back, not just come back and pay attention to here, but come back and feel here, connected here, feel rooted here, feeling present here, feeling in your body here. It's a slow process for many people, um, but over the months and years that you do this meditation, what you'll probably find is your body become more and more awake, more and more a uh, very rich resource, more and more uh, kind of a, um, a, um, a source of intelligence, a force, source of understanding, and a source of uh, joy, a source of love, sort of source of compassion. Many of the best qualities of a human being come through being embodied. And if we're not embodied, it's hard to have some of the best of human, human, humanness coming through us. So that's the introduction to the body. So let's uh, do some meditation. So with your body, establish a posture that is both, both expresses a kind of alertness, a kind of physical presence, but also one that has some modicum, some sense of being at ease as well. And it, it's worth taking some time kind of getting into your body. In, um, I did many years of Zen training, and one of the things I saw, learn, saw there is that the um, longer someone was a Zen student, the more time they took getting their posture ready for meditation. They would kind of go back, rock back and forth, forward and back, kind of get everything kind of lined up, be really careful with their shoulders, feel their spine, kind of get their hands just right. You know, and in some ways, the longer someone can meditate, the more little details of your body you're familiar with, and you get them all just right. And then gently close your eyes. And it's helpful at the beginning of a meditation session to take a few long, slow, <coughs> deep breaths. And part of the function of that is to enter into your body through feeling the massage, the movement of your breathing, your chest expanding and so forth. And also as you exhale, to allow yourself to relax. Let go. Let go of the thoughts and concerns of the day. Take a few long, slow, deep breaths to remind yourself of your body, that here is in this body, and this is where you're going to be, you're going to live during these minutes of meditation. And then letting your breath return to normal. No special effort to breathe any special way. 
And perhaps again, as you exhale, soften some of your body that may be easy to soften. Or send a wave of softening to your muscles of your face. Perhaps you can let your mouth drop open briefly to soften your jaw. And then let the teeth float together again. It can be helpful to soften the shoulders, shoulder blades. You might be able to soften the chest. And also to soften the belly. Let the belly hang forward a little bit. And here and now, become aware of your body as broadly and globally as you can. Whatever sense of aliveness, vitality, warmth, pulsing, pressure, vibration, energy. And you might be aware of uncomfortable sensations in your body. It's possible. See if you can be very simple with it not having commentary or judgments about it or meaning, assigning meaning to its presence. Just kind of let it be there and let yourself become aware of the body in a more broad, expansive way than focusing in any particular area of discomfort. And then within the body, as part of the body, become aware of how the body experiences breathing. You might feel the movements of the chest, the rib cage, the belly, the diaphragm. You might be aware of the sensations of air going in through the nostrils. In whatever way you can feel the physical sensations connected to breathing, you can feel the rhythm, the alternation that comes with breathing in and out. Begin centering centering yourself on those sensations. Let your awareness take those in. Being careful not to be caught by any commentary you have, but rather stay living with the immediacy of those sensations of breathing. There's no need to make any commentary or judgments about the mind wandering off in thought. 
soon as you notice that that's happening, begin again with your breathing. Very, very, try to be very simple and begin again. And as you begin again with your breathing, do so with a little sense that you're going to hang in there with the breathing in and breathing out, one after the other. Letting go of your thoughts in favor of hanging, absorbing, taking in the embodied physical experience of breathing. It's not so much that you're watching the breathing as you are inside the sensations of breathing, inside the breathing, feeling it, sensing it, experiencing it. Some people find it helpful to very quietly, very soft whisper in the mind, to label the in-breath in, the out-breath out, or the rising of the chest or belly is rising, and the falling is falling, to help you stay connected.
notice if you're getting caught up in commentary. If you are, see if you can disentangle yourself in favor of being present for the experience of breathing. If anything is happening that's making it difficult to be with the breathing, be relaxed about that. Notice what that is. Notice it without commentary, without judgment. Just, this is how it is. Simple acknowledgement. And maybe it's easier to come back and be with the breathing once you acknowledge the difficulty. And then now, <clears throat> stop paying attention to your breathing. Let go of any effort towards your breath. And instead, turn your attention to the strongest sensation, physical sensation in your body. It doesn't have to be that strong. It could be very strong. It doesn't matter what it is. It could be pleasant. It could be unpleasant. But just very, in a very relaxed way, you can soft, relaxed. Bring your attention to take, let your attention take in. Be present for whatever is the strongest physical sensation in your body. If it disappears while you're watching it, present for it, then find the next one. And as you do it, as you stay present for your physical experience, notice if there's any tendency to commentary, judgment, meaning making. In the best of your ability, separate the two out, put aside the commentary, and let yourself feel more fully, sense more fully the sensation in your body. Notice what might happen to it as you're present for it in a fuller way.
Feel the strongest sensation in your body from underneath, from the top, from the front, from the back. Feel and sense it, almost like you can do from different directions. Not so much watching it from the mind, as sensing it from within the body. Giving it permission to be there, it's okay. Just letting it come into awareness. And then for the last minute of the sitting, come back again to your breathing. And then hang, hang in there with the rhythm of your breathing. And then to end the meditation, it can be helpful to take a few long, slow, deep breaths. Or fully connect again, reconnect to your body. And then when you feel ready, you can open your eyes. So the usual instructions for mindfulness meditation recommends that you use the breathing as the center, as the default. You keep kind of grounding yourself, centering yourself on the experience of breathing. There are some people where the breath, the breath is not um, so useful. Uh, so it's kind of indicated for some people. So, but most people, it's fine. You know, then there's other, other things we can use as kind of the grounding, as a centering place. But the breath tends to be pretty good. But the point of mindfulness meditation is not to live in your breathing all the time, but to learn how to bring a wise and, and a freeing, liberating attention to all aspects of our life. And the way we do this in meditation practice is we choose to bring our attention to center ourselves on the breath, give some emphasis on the breathing, until some other experience becomes more compelling or sometimes as we talk about becomes more predominant. And when the other experience becomes more compelling, then we let go of the breath and bring our silent, non-discursive attention on that experience. So for now, for this week here, we're going to only do that for the body, just to keep it simple. So if a, a sensation happens in your body that's stronger, then you're kind of staying with the breathing then you can let go of the breath and bring your attention, let your attention settle into that physical experience of your body that's more compelling, that's more predominant. Sometimes it can be very pleasant, it can be a pleasant sensation. Sometimes it, it can be unpleasant. Sometimes for beginners, uh, there's certainly their share of discomfort when they first start meditating because they're not used to holding a meditation posture. So it takes a while sometimes, some weeks or some months, to, for the body to kind of work out some of the kinks, some of the places where it's um, you know, not aligned or tight or something not strong enough. And um, but the idea is then is to 
bring to whatever is most compelling, most predominant. And over time, different things will speak up. Different things will want your attention, will be compelling. And the theory behind this in mindfulness meditation is if you, if you don't have an agenda for what you pay attention to, except you know, there's, there's some priority to the breath, but you're not locked to it. If you don't have an agenda, then of the, the full spectrum of, what, of your life will eventually reveal itself to you uh, by becoming compelling, different things. And the things that you need to look at and work through and resolve and all kinds of things will come up in its own time. And you can be very relaxed. You don't have to be in a hurry or expect things to even happen but with time. So sometimes emotions come up, sometimes various thoughts that come up, sometimes body sensations come up. A lot of things will come up. And over a period of time, a lot of stuff gets worked through. In the traditional Buddhism, they call it a purification process. Um, or an emptying process, or a clearing process, or a aligning process, or a something, a variety of things. And um, so there has to be a willingness to let go of the breath and open up to the wider spectrum of what's going on. Um, so, in terms of the body for this week, so if the body becomes more compelling or more predominant than your breathing, just let go of your breathing. You don't have to pay attention to it then. And let your attention center itself on that part of your body where there's some strong sensation. And the idea here, again, is, is to separate out the commentary you might have of it and just stay with the immediacy of that experience. It's often, the immediate, immediate experience is often very much more simple than the commentary. So stay with the simplicity of it. And then um, hang there with it. Get to know it better. Feel it more fully. Uh, see if you can enter into the experience more fully. Really sense and be present for it. Or, if entering into it more fully is too much, uh, then imagine that you're taking a, a bird's eye view of it. And still stay present for that predominant experience, but imagine like you're a bird up in the sky, holding at a distance watching it, looking at it. And then maybe, for some experiences, that's the way you can stay present for it, because if you get too close to it, it might feel you know, just too intense. So then kind of imagine you pull back. You're still staying present, but you kind of like have this bird's eye view that might make it possible to kind of be there with it. So you can kind of adjust the, the distance you have. Um, the idea is to be present for it as long as it's predominant. In a sense, what we're doing here is training our mindfulness. And as mindfulness can be trained in anything, and if there's strong sensations in the body, we're training it there. If there's an idea that this strong sensation shouldn't be there, that's a comment. That's commentary. If you have the idea, I need to get rid of this, that's a comment. If you have the idea, if only this wasn't here, then I could really meditate. <laughs> That's a comment. <laughs> you don't have to believe any of those. You don't have to get involved in those commentary. It's actually, uh, you actually develop a tremendous amount of power, personal power, tremendous, if you learn how not to get caught or to believe those thoughts. And our, th our thinking mind will say, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm the one who's in charge, ain't I? But uh, you'll have tremendous freedom, tremendous power if you don't believe in those thoughts. Some of them you might, in, in certain situations, pick up and maybe they're good thoughts to have. You don't have to discard all your thinking once and for all. But if you have the ability not to be pulled automatically into their world, it gives you a lot of power, a lot of strength. So, so um, try, try to keep it really simple. Okay, so you enter into the world of the sensations of your body, feel it there, sense it. It can be helpful to uh, label it, to have this mental note. So if you feel an itch, then name it. Itch, itch. If it stays for a long time, then the thought arises, it's been there too long. That's a comment. <laughs> Back to the itch, the simplicity of just itch. Itch, itch. And, and by, by using a mental label, itch, it's a very soft little kind of nudge. Stay there. Stay relaxed. Stay present. Be present for that experience. Don't run away. Don't get caught up in commentary. Just the simplicity of the itch. Just be there. Um, some of the sensations you might become aware of might be uncomfortable. Might be discomfort. Pain. Uh, what's very interesting about pain is that, um, what, you know, physiologists of pain, psychologists of pain, researchers of pain have found out is that pain is not a, a singular thing, it's not a unitary thing. 
It's a compo- the experience of pain is a composite made up of many uh, s- um, signals that come together, and together they create the notion of pain. And um, so, so there's certainly a sig- signal for the body, the nerves, but that's not enough to often to create just a sense of the idea of pain. Sometimes there's um, associations, there's memory, there's uh, meaning making, there's projection, there's fear, there's anxiety, there's all kinds of other things that come into play. And, um, and so some of that has to do with commentary. And, and a lot of people, number, of people, number of people have pointed out that they might be in physical pain about something until they get the diagnosis. And then their pain seems to go away. And partly because of the psychological factor that comes into play sometimes. Um, and um, so what's interesting is, is to be present for pain and slowly by being present to be able to tease apart the commentary, the judgments, the reactions, the emotions from the pain itself. And what probably many people find is that they, if they can do that, uh, the pain often is not so bad. The what makes pain difficult is all the secondary reactions to it. And so just to learn that this training, the mindfulness training is to be very simple, very soft and simple with how it actually is. Learning not to get caught up in the flow of, of these comments that we so easily run our lives. So stay there. And so the more you stay there, the more you kind of tease apart the subtler and subtler comments and judgments, reactions, feelings that might be there connected to it. That's one of the things that happens. The other thing that happens is that uh, with pain, for example, is we have a tendency to see pain as a singularity, as a single thing, all that pain. But pain is also a composite that's made up of a variety of different sensations. And as long as we hold ourselves as a distance from the pain, that's pain. I don't want to look at it or I feel it. Get it away from me. That pain. We don't. Uh, we feel it more as a singular thing. But if you relax and soften and just go into the pain and feel it, then it tends to, uh, at some points, it might break up and you see it's made up of a variety of different sensations. It might be uh, pulling, twisting, searing, stabbing, <laughs> burning, <laughs> you know, uh, vibration. You know, it's a lot of different kind of, just, you know, actual different things. You might also find out if you get really close to the pain that the pain is not constant. It's actually uh, turning itself on and off. It's actually not always in the same place. It's actually moving around. It might be moving around within a square centimeter, but it's actually moving and pulsing and kind of sparking. And, doing, and you see it kind of sparking and vibrating and pulsing and moving. It's a little bit harder for the mind to get caught up in, oh no, this is permanent. Or this is, you know, this is constant or whatever. So it's, it's, it, a new world opens up. To, the, to many experiences, when you bring this careful mindfulness to it, that drops below the level of the commentary and the concepts we have about it. So if you relate to pain as just pain, you're probably relating to it mostly through a concept, a concept of pain, and all the associations that has, you have to that. But if you experience it as sensation, it might be, it's still uncomfortable, but it's, it might be more like twisting and pressure and tension and a variety of particular sensations. And so you want to feel that. Same thing for pleasant sensations. Um, we might go in and feel it and just be present for it. Um, also, what we include in physical sensations is sounds. And so, sounds are not meant to be seen as intrusions for mindfulness meditation. They're uh, to be included within it. Now, when people do concentration meditation, which is a different kind of meditation, then there are things which are distractions. Because if you're trying to concentrate on one thing, then there are things that are trying to take you away from that. In mindfulness meditation, we're not locking on to one thing. We're not locking on the breath. We're learning to open the awareness to what is happening. So if what's predominant, what's most compelling is a sound, then we do sound meditation. So if your neighbor's dog is barking, that's, you don't have to be angry and say, well, that's disturbing my meditation. The dog barking becomes your meditation. And what we do then is we turn the attention into the listening. The listening, hearing, hearing. And we just take in the vibrations, the sense, the feelings, the whole experience of listening to the dog barking. My teacher in Burma, great meditation master, um, uh, he's, he's kind of like a, he was kind of like, he's still alive, he's kind of like a fighter kind of guy. Probably should have been in a boxing ring. Kind of intimidating to be around. You know, he raises his eyebrow and we'd all say, oh no. And, um, and uh, so when he was a young monk learning to meditate, his first kind of meditation retreat, 
um, he had a roommate, another monk in his room. And um, that roommate was lazy. And my teacher, he was, you know, self-righteous, he was heroic, he was going to sit there and meditate and get enlightened and everything. And um, so he would sit up in bed late at night to meditate. And his roommate went to bed early, and his roommate snored. So this was a problem. Until he figured out or understood that he had to include the snoring as part of his meditation. And he turned his attention to the snoring and just did snoring meditation. <laughs> and my teacher said that was his entryway to deep meditation. That became the subject, the object for his deep concentration, deep mindfulness that opened up, that it opened up. He had to drop his commentary, he had to drop his reaction, his self-righteousness and just be there with the simplicity of the snoring. So, What's beautiful about this is that we don't, in mindfulness meditation, we don't talk about distractions. There are no distractions. Just something else to include in the awareness. So for now, because we're trying to keep it simple this first couple of weeks, breath, body, sounds. So you try to stay with the breath the best you can. If, uh, if, um, if strong sensations arise in your body that are more compelling than your breath, let go of the breath and turn to that, like we did in that last meditation. If strong, compelling sounds arise, be relaxed. Include that. Soften. Every t- and every time you take in something new, you realize, oh, that's compelling now. I need to take that in. Me- try to see if you can meet that experience with some sense of being at ease, some sense of relaxedness. Don't be alarmed. Don't pounce on it. Kind of, okay, now I'm going to take in this experience, like I would standing at the beach, taking in the sunset and the breeze and all that. But let me do it in a soft way. Even if part of you is, you know, kind of upset that the knees hurt. See if you can train yourself to begin meeting it with a little bit of softness. Okay, this is what it is. So, it might be nice to hear from a few of you uh, what happened in your meditation. We did it 20 minutes. At the end, when I asked you to turn your attention to the most compelling or strongest sensation in your body, and you brought that into your awareness, sight of your awareness, what happened to you? What happened to your meditation? What was that like? Anybody would like to share? I hadn't noticed it until tonight, but um, when you asked us to stop focusing on the breathing and I relaxed, uh, I was very surprised at how my pulse rate or the blood flowing around my body became so powerful. I was very surprised by it and, and I actually had to go back to my breathing because it was, it was sort of disturbing for me at the beginning. but. <laughs> I could really feel my blood pulsing. Can happen, yes. Yes, for a variety of reasons, but that's fine. And so, thank you. Up here in the front. Yeah. I had a meditation teacher once who said, um, I used to think that my mind was the most important part of myself until I realized who was telling me that. (laughs) And so in my meditation practice, I've always been struggling between, it's like a battle between my mind and my breath or spaciousness. And so coming to the body this time, I thought, I can't believe I've forgotten about the body. And so that was really grounding for me. And it wasn't so much about, oh, breath, breath, which is important, but just to be able to feel the sensations of the body made so much sense and it was so powerful for me. So I really appreciate Great. that Good. instruction. And what I hope you'll learn by the end of the, the six weeks is that there's no need to struggle between different parts of who we are. That there's a way you use, use the attention, the awareness, to be very inclusive and include rather than maintain the conflict between different parts. So, so, so when, when we talk about the thinking and the mind, you will expand to include much more of that as well. Someone else? Yes, please. What's really interesting for me is my mid-back, it's where my attention always goes, and it goes between water flowing through it, very comfortable, to a stiff rock, and it just changes and it just alternates. And I started doing the naming thing that you talked about. Um, I just said, you know, stiff flow. And without judging it, it became as if it's, it's an ex- form of acceptance, which is quite amazing. Mm. So the naming of it being present was a form of acceptance. Great. So um, some people uh, will use the word acceptance to describe uh, how, uh, 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 what the mindful awareness entails. It entails a kind of a presence that allows things to be there 
that some people describe as being acceptance. There's a book called Radical Acceptance that describes this practice. Thank you. Any other reports about the experience or any questions so far about what I've said about the instructions? And yes, please. If you're focusing on your breath, but it's hard for you to breathe, like you're really congested, should you just focus on being congested? or? <laughs> you could. I mean, any, 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 anything can be a subject of mindfulness. And, uh, and you probably have a lot of commentary and stuff to tease apart. But you can be it. It's, you know, it's maybe you have, you'll have, un- in some ways, an uncomfortable meditation because of that. But certainly, you could do that. Um, it might also be that if you try, if your mind is really scattered and you can't really be there very well with the breath, even when it's congested, maybe there's something else that's more useful to pay attention to. So, for example, um, it might be more useful rather than being aware of the breath around the area of your face and your nose, just to be aware of the movement in your belly. Soften your belly and feel the movement down there. Some people find it useful to be aware of the, the expanding contraction. It's very subtle, but expanding contraction of the back rib cage. It's much more neutral. It's not connected to the congestion and all that. And, and the congestion kind of just disappear because you're so focused on the sensations in your back. Um, some people, uh, who, who, if, if people are not going to use the breathing as a subject of meditation, um, one, one common um, alternative is to do uh, listening meditation, to do sounds. So just you know, just uh, be very relaxed and open, just to hear sounds, and you, and notice how different sounds arise, uninvited, just suddenly appear, un, uncreated by you, and um, and just the hearing, hearing, traffic, hearing, rustling, hearing, just take it all in, and then if something else becomes compelling, then you can let go of the sound and go through that part of your body. But um, just stay, stay in the present moment. Sounds are always in the present. And so it's a way of training yourself to be present and attentive. Um, some, people find it so, they, some people find it's very uh, relaxing to do uh, listening meditation that way. That's another alternative. And so when the body's difficult that way, uh, sometimes it can be helpful just to ignore it in a sense for a while. Yes, in the back. I, I noticed um, this time and last that... Um, <clears throat> Most of my intrusions are uh, little preparations for good answers for the teacher when the, it's over. And I, I, get, I go back to second grade a great deal with very good answers. So when I, I had noticed already that um, for some reason my left clavicle hurt. It just hurt. And, and then when you said to let go of the breathing and just go with the one thing that was most prevalent it was it was clearly that I didn't have to go around too far and um, and I was ready for an answer I ready to tell the teacher what it felt like you know so I just noticed that that's like a real common intrusion for me Great. and and it was not too hard to say oh that old familiar intrusion <laughs> I know that one and um, so anyway that's what Great. I was going to say Great. So I mean, p- part of the function of this kind of meditation practice is to, over time, begin revealing uh, the common habits, the common mental kind of reactions, responses we have. Some of them which can be very subtle and not seen in daily life because they happen so quickly. And, um, but as we get more centered, more focused, more uh, still in the mind through meditation, uh, these kinds of things become really clear. And once you start seeing them, it gives you the option to have a new relationship to them. To not have them push you around, but to actually uh, relax them, let go of them, not believe them, things like that. Learning not to believe your thinking is a great help. Yes? I wasn't here last week, so I'm not sure if you talked about sleepiness at all, but um, I was struggling with that tonight. And so when you said turn your mind to what it was that was physically bothering you, it was sleepiness. So I could do it for a split second until the sleepiness sort of took over again and I was gone. Great, good, good. Well, I didn't say to focus on what's bothering you. I mean, it's okay to have things bother you, but that's kind of more in the realm of the commentary. And uh, there's nothing that needs to, when you do this meditation practice here, there's nothing you need to think about that's bothering. It's just stuff happening. Um, But what I said was what's strongest. Now, great. So, um, sleep is, sleepiness is one of those things that can be quite compelling, quite strong. And there's two general approaches with sleepiness. 
the pure way for mindfulness meditation is you take the sleepiness on as a subject of investigation, subject of awareness. So you go into the body and you feel the heaviness of the eyes, the heaviness in your cheeks, the low energy and you know what's going on in your, in your shoulders perhaps, the murkiness of the mind. You kind of explore all the different kind of sensations connected to sleepiness. Two things uh, happen then. One is that you might wake up a little bit because you get interested. Wow. And the other is you're doing mindfulness. So that can work for some people. Just do that. That's the pure way. Uh, the, the, I should say, maybe I shouldn't use pure. So the impure way. <laughs> the other way is, um, is to do something about it. <laughs> and uh, so there's a variety of things you can do if you're sleepy in meditation. Uh, one is you could open your eyes and continue the meditation with your eyes open. Just opening your eyes sometimes can bring more alertness and less likely to fall asleep. Sit up straighter. Put more energy into your body. Uh, sometimes uh, awakening a little bit more mental energy, effort. Kind of try to notice more things more carefully, more often. So you're kind of more attentive. You can sometimes wake the mind up a little bit. Uh, you can also do standing meditation. You can hear a sitting, you know, you're all sitting, but if you get really sleepy, just quietly stand in your place and continue with doing the meditation with your standing. And most people find that once they're standing, they're not going to fall asleep. Um, it, once, someone did fall over. <laughs> but I've been teaching this for almost 20 years, so once in 20 years. is. <laughs> and um, the, um, and people, people, more often people have fallen over sitting, so that's... <laughs> And, um, and then, um, you know, you can always wash your hands and the uh, face with cold water and often helps as well. So things like that. Get more sleep. So, yes, please. And after you. Yeah. Is there any difference in meditating by yourself and in, or meditating with a group of people? Yes, there are. Many people report differences, but different people report different kinds of differences. Um, uh, some people find that uh, it's a lot easier to meditate in a group than alone. Uh, there's a kind of a group support, the group feeling, ambience, various things that help. And it's a lot easier to stay focused. And some people are really surprised. They come here Monday night and they sit 45 minutes. How do I manage that? I, at home, I can luckily sit 15 minutes because it's kind of just, everything's kind of, all this energy is going in that direction. But then there are other people who find that it's really irritating to be around all these people. <laughs> you know, it's just like so much people and the rustling and, and you know, this person sat down too close to me and, you know, you can hear their breathing and, you know, it's so much better to sit at home. So it depends on the person, you know, so, so people often report differences, but different people have different. But the energy, the energy around you is still the same. Yes, uh, how to say, I, yeah, I think that um, there is a kind of energy or atmosphere that occurs when there's a lot of people meditating and really quiet together. And if you are still enough, some people are still enough or quiet enough, they can tune into that and feel support from that. So like, you know, if you, I mean, it's not that not strange. I mean, if um, I mean, sometimes we've had the UPS burst in here through the door when we're meditating and it's immediately shh, the UPS guy gets quiet, you know. <laughs> it, it doesn't take a lot to kind of feel something. And um, so, um, so there can be certain kind of uh, group energy that happens, group atmosphere that, that, that people can feel. And I feel it. Um, so yes, that can happen. But there could be other factors that override that for some individuals where it actually works better to meditate at home, alone. So all the way in the back. I saw your hand before. And pass it straight back to the back row. Um, just to, I guess, when you said sometimes people fall over. Maybe you need to move a little. Stand up. Is that okay with you? Um, oh. So I had the feeling that I'm going to fall. Yes. It's a split second feeling. Uh -huh. Do you actually? Then, then I adjust, and I don't adjust myself. Just it's like I'm out of control. So you're, sit, you're sitting, meditating, and it's, do you actually physically kind of drop? Yes. Uh -huh. yes and, but, but, I'm feeling like I'm dropping, but not falling asleep, just uh -huh. like I'm going to fall. And does your body, does it, it's almost like your body writes itself, it catches itself? Yes. yes. Mm, no problem. 
<laughs> it's uh, um, it could be that you're falling asleep. Sleep, sleep can happen very quickly and very momentarily, and then there can be a, a dropping of the of the body, a kind of false forward. But also sometimes that happens. Um, there can be uh, a moment, moments, very short, sometimes very brief moments of um, the body, the body and mind get very, very relaxed. And so it's no longer caught up in its normal train of thoughts and concerns and everything. And sometimes if it happens in a very deep, very thorough way, then um, there's something that could be a dropping that happens, a dropping away. And um, mostly you can just take that as a good sign. That's, you know, that, that's, that's my, my general answer. It's hard to know without really getting, hearing much more and, you know, maybe over time. But I would generally take it as a good sign that you're getting relaxed and there's a kind of dropping and... So, does that seem okay with you? As an answer? Okay. Maybe one more over here. Yes. Hi. I um, had a, uh, a sharp pain in my chest and kind of in my back, and so that's what I was really aware of. That's what took over. Um, I have a lot of aversion to it, so it's really hard for me to tease apart just the experience of it from my judgment of it. Uh, the other thing is that I find that I, I get more of that when I meditate in a group and when I'm meditating on my own, I don't seem to have as strong a, a physical sensation. Okay. So, yeah, so it's hard to know. A few things. Um, when we, in the, next week we'll talk about emotions and like the reactions. So if, an, if aversion is more compelling than the pain, then, again, the instruction is to pay attention to what's most compelling. So if the aversion or the resistance is more compelling, then um, we, we forget about the pain and focus on the aversion. And that's a whole interesting uh, exploration in its own right. The sense, the feelings, the sensations of aversion and feel that and be present for it. And once you turn towards aversion in that way, maybe it's easier to tease them apart. And maybe that's easier to tease it apart once you uh, uh, look directly at the aversion itself. Also, uh, but also you have to be patient. You know, one of the first lessons that any meditator needs to learn is patience. And so it's, it takes a while to learn to tease these things apart, to find out how it works and be present. And this thing about it, it hurts more when you're with a group, it's, uh, I don't know why, but um, uh, as you get more into this and more familiar with yourself, more able to catch the subtleties of what's going on in your mind, you might one day notice that when you come in there to meditate, there's a very subtle, very quiet little judgment or thought or reaction about being in a group that is kind of the trigger for that pain or that accentuating that pain. But it's so subtle that the normal mind can't see it. It happens so quickly. But when you get quiet enough, you might see that little judgment or thought that might, might arise. So it's a, certainly an, an adventure. There's a lot, that, you know, the time that you do this practice, it's a phenomenal process of self-discovery discover so much, and, but you, not only do you discover yourself, but more important, you discover how to be free of yourself. And as you're free of yourself, you're more free actually to be yourself in a fuller, more complete way. It's not like you're becoming, you know, a non-entity. You become freer to be yourself in a full way. Um, and then eventually, it, 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 if you follow this far enough in a Buddhist kind of way, the sense of um, knowing yourself, the sense of self falls away. And, um, and that's a wonderful feeling, just to be present without that, t- that self-consciousness. Um, okay. So, to shift gears a little bit. Um, I would like to do a kind of meditation exercise with you. So it'll just be a few minutes. If, uh, so if you can, get yourself into a meditative posture again. And <clears throat> gently close your eyes. And take just a couple of deep breaths to settle in. And relax. Get into your body. And now, bring your awareness into your right hand. A 
a heightened sensitivity to what's happening in your right hand. Vibration, pressure, coolness, warmness, tingling, pulsing. Heaviness, lightness, hardness, softness. Feeling the three-dimensional quality of that hand, the sensations there. The palm of your right hand. back of your hand. The fingers. And then letting letting yourself be soft, relaxed, in a soft, calm, deliberate way, switch your attention to your left hand. And then feel, start start to awakening a greater sensitivity to what's happening in your left hand. Not thinking about it, but sensing and feeling, tingling, vibration, energy, warmth, coolness, softness, hardness, heaviness, lightness. And now, with some sense of being calm about it, move your attention to experience your breathing. Wherever in your body you experience the breathing most easily. In the same way that you took in the experience of your hands, heighten the sensitivity in that area of your body where you experience the breathing. Entering into the world of sensations there, the fullness of sensing in that part of your body where it responds to breathing. Every time you exhale, 
let go of whatever you're thinking about. So that as you breathe in, you can feel more fully, sense more fully the experience of breathing. So hopefully that little exercise gives you a little sense of um, that the, the awareness we're developing, cultivating, is a lot to do with sensing more fully. It's not, it's not just watching, but kind of being in it and sensing and letting the sense, letting the whole area kind of uh, become more alive or more aware and more kind of show it, reveal itself more fully for what's actually going on there. Many people, when they do this thing with the hand, you know they discover a lot of sensations that are going on there that they probably wouldn't have been aware of if they had, hadn't been told to pay attention to the hand. These, you know, they would never occurred to them. It's like, how many of you have you noticed your little toe today, tonight? You know, you don't pay attention to it, right? So, but if you can bring your attention to your toes, you can, you know, you can be told to do that. So, so, so you, it comes alive with a lot more sensations. So, that sense of kind of heightened sensitivity is partly what we're doing with this mindfulness practice. So when you're feeling the breath, it isn't just kind of, from a distance, kind of just a matter of fact, kind of watching it come and go. But it's actually going in there and allowing a heightened sensitivity to arise in your body around the experience of breathing, you know, that part of your body was breathing. And then if something else becomes more compelling, <clears throat> like your uh, sensations in your body, <clears throat> you can let go of the breath and take in those sensations. And then again, the idea is to try to be more fully there, to heighten sensitivity, heighten the awareness of what it actually is and the simplicity of it as apart, as apart from the judgment or commentary or reactions to it. Just how it is, simply by itself. Um, if it uh, becomes too intense, if it's painful, it becomes too intense, uh, and you're getting discouraged, uh, please, by all means, uh, shift your posture. The, the, um, the so-called official rest posture in meditation is to, you know, sitting on the floor, is to bring your knees up in front of you like this and wrap your arms around your knees. So, so that's a kind of way of resting if you need to. And then when you feel rested, or then you can come back. Um, but you know, shift your posture if it's getting you know, too much. But um, what we want to do in meditation, ideally, is not shift your posture at the first sign of discomfort. Um, if you're only free when you're comfortable, you're not really free. <laughs> So part of the training of mindfulness, there is a training to learn how to hang in there, hang out with bring mindfulness and presence to uncomfortable things so we can find how to be free with that. Kind of discover the wisdom, discover the, 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 the development that happens there as well. Um, so, but you know, it's your choice how far you go with discomfort, how much you stay with it. And um, but maybe you'll find it useful to hang in there a little more than you normally would in your kind of normal habitual reactions to things. 
Um, next week we'll do mindfulness of emotions. And um, as I said last week, um, it's easier to become aware of... Um, once you get, uh, with, uh, uh, Being aware of breath makes it easier to become aware of the body. Being aware of the body makes it easier to become aware of emotions. Being aware of emotions makes it easier to become aware of thinking. Being aware of thinking makes it easier to become aware of the mind. So it kind of builds. So um, thank you very much.